Hi, everybody. I am Pat Pearsall. Welcome, everyone. I'm glad to see everybody here. Um, I have been given two seconds, so my two seconds is almost up. Welcome, and um, I'm, I don't need to introduce him because if you didn't know who he was, uh, you wouldn't be here. So here is the man of the hour himself, Dr. Stephen Greer. Hey everybody. <laughs> Thank you. You're beautiful. Thank you guys. Beautiful. <laughs> I thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Uh, I want to really thank you for coming because you're going to make this a really special documentary feature film where we're going to pull the curtain back so at least a billion people find out the world is waiting. It's coming. And And I really want to thank the staff of the facility, the producers, everyone who's volunteered, Justice, who's running the PowerPoint, almost our whole team are volunteers. And I want to, yeah, they're beautiful. You know, we've done this for 32 years without an officer staff. Yeah. They go, really? I go, yeah, no. You know, it all goes into the work. Right? So if you can help us at thelostcenturyfilm.com, we'd appreciate it. Because the reason we crowdfund these feature films is that no corporate shill, no one can take anything out or put anything in. It's the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And that's what we have to get to the people. Yeah. I especially also want to thank, you know, Pat, who's been working for years with us. Raven Nabolsi is here, 25 years. So many people. Shane Sweeney, who's been helping, and the whole team. You know, Josh Gordon is here. If you see him, say hi. He's volunteering. We would not have the CE5 contact app without Josh Gordon. He did that as a volunteer. Thank you, Josh. And by the way, it has been in the top 10 apps, educational apps in the world for two and a half years with no marketing money spent. That is sort of a phenomenal story. The media is covering it up, but it's going. All right. And I also want to uh, thank my wife who isn't here. Uh, she's by webinar. Hi, Emily. <laughs> no exaggeration. If she had not worked shoulder to shoulder, you know, as my partner, none of this would have happened. She's an angel. Woo! When she was in the Peace Corps, her name's Emily, and her everyone called her Saint M. She said it was saintly, beautiful. So I mean, we we she's behind the scenes, never wants to be seen, doesn't need to be thanked. Next, I'll go to the next. I want to show this man. If you don't know who he is, he's the most brilliant man I've ever worked with. I introduced him to this subject in 1997. He just passed away. This film is dedicated to his memory. He is a genius. He has the biggest archive in the world on new energy, free energy, all of it. And he passed away rather suddenly um, in April. And we're going to dedicate this movie to him and his wife and his family, his children and grandchildren. Thank you, Tony. So let's take a look at this. Nature is stored up in the universe, infinite energy. And back when Nikola Tesla wrote this, they didn't know what we're going to talk about tonight, the quantum vacuum, zero-point energy 
how the universe is being propelled. Next. So what I want to go through is what is this lost century? So the, this lost century is literally 100 years, more than that now, of technologies that have existed that have vanished. And how have they vanished? So what we're going to cover is how they were invented, the basic principles of how they operate. No, this is not going to be a physics and engineering class. So those of you who are physicists, we'll talk another time. Because everyone will go to sleep, but you and me. Um, and we're going to also, more importantly, describe what were the strategic mistakes made that caused those technologies to vanish. Uh, and what other activities, what has worked to suppress them for 100 years. Because it's a combination of human error by the inventors and scientific teams with very powerful vested interests that don't want to see oil terminated, which it will when this comes out. So that is a huge part of what we're going to present. But then we want to go through, I'm just giving you this whole overview in the first five minutes. We're going to go through how the architecture of secrecy has worked to keep this secret. And how it still works. I mean, I was just recently in a meeting in Washington with the people who manage the black budget of the United States. They have no access to this material. It's, you know, this is really disturbing stuff. Then we're going to go through uh, the entire view of the world after we strategically fix how to bring it out. What will the world look like in 20 years? 50 years? 100 years? 1,000 years? 500,000 years? So we're going to go through that at the end. Because what we have to do is give people hope. Hope that there is a future. Most people don't see a way out. And so early on, we're going to do sort of this tour of how screwed up the planet's become. Because between the late 1800s and now, the ingenious inventions and sciences that could have moved us off that extinction level path that we're on have all been ruthlessly suppressed, confiscated. And the only way that's going to change it is not going to change in Washington. It is not going to change in a large corporation. Unlikely. It's going to change by us, the people doing it. So it's about us. The other big issue is, you know, who are the players who've done this? And exactly how do they operate? What are the methods of suppression? So that is what we're going to really go through. Now, the first thing we want to do is give you an update on the state of the world. So let's go next. No. Let's look at this. Let me play this. Here's an... You know what this is. Everybody's seen it. Dude, this is a fucking drone, bro. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the NSA. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. We're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots from the west. Oh, thing, dude. That's not an LNS though, is it? It's not. It is an LNS, dude. Well, if there's a good thing, it's a rotated. <laughs> okay. You saw what I said at the beginning. This is an alternative energy and propulsion device. Now, the next slide, you'll see what the Pentagon said. Not fictitious. These are the ones. And look at these. This, this, these are things that have existed all the way back into the 60s. Michael Schratt did that illustration. But the one that they call the Tic Tac here off the coast of San Diego, the white one, looked very much like this. These have been made by the Lockheed Skunk Works. So let's move on. And so the Pentagon, you know, this is, you know, absolutely, uh, the date here is wrong. Uh, this was very recently. There are physical objects that have been, you know, absolutely tracked optically, all sensors, a lot of classified sensors that I know about, and they have the data on it. They're solid objects. They have no means of propulsion through jet, rocket, or nuclear. There's no heat signature, no heat, no exhaust. And they're moving like you just saw. And it's been confirmed by the U.S. government, finally, a couple of years ago. Next. And when I was in a meeting very recently, 
there was a man at the uh, who is responsible to the U.S. government now, ordered by law to look into this. He came out to the Lockheed Skunk Works out here in California. Remember, this guy manages the black budget of the United States and the three-letter agencies. One of the most senior guys, not an appointed person. And he was suing a bunch of antique aircraft. No, really, like jets. And so he knew he had been gaslit. He knew he had been deceived and diverted. And that's when they called me in in February. I can't talk about it too much. But what I will say is that this is the same story I've heard since 1993 when I first briefed the director of the CIA. And where people who should know don't, and the people who should have never kept this secret have that information. we got to change that. It's very dangerous. Next. So a lot of people say, well, how is this thing moving? <laughs> There's no fuel on board. There's no nuclear power plant. There's no jets and no rockets. Well, way back in the 40s, Dr. Casimir, later, he predicted, and later it was proven in the 50s, what's called the zero-point energy field. Next. So in the next slide, you'll see <laughs> the consequences of keeping all this secret. We are in the process right now of, of doing something that I've termed planeticide. The deliberate killing of an entire planet with malice of forethought through greed and stupidity and power, hungry people. All the damage we're going to see in a few minutes, totally avoidable. Every bit of it since the 1920s at least. And we can prove this. So when we look at the situation where we're spending trillions of dollars on solutions that will not get us there, we're going to go through these. We have to then say, if we're, what are we doing wrong? Because since 1968 with Rachel Carson and A Silent Spring, and in the 70s, where everybody was predicting the global warming and the pollution and all this and the oceans dying, we described the problem great. No one has come up with a viable solution. These technologies you're going to hear about tonight are the solution. Next. And I, I wrote, put this up here because I firmly believe there can be no peace on this planet without justice. And there can be no justice when half the population of the world is required to live in abject poverty that is a direct result of the world's energy system. What do I mean by that? The billions of people who don't even have plumbing and don't even have electricity or gas, if they wanted to live like you and I do, guess what? The price of gas only would be $100 a gallon because it would create such a demand beyond what the supply could ever be to refine and provide. And so we live, and Americans in Western rich countries and Japan don't think of this. Literally half the world's population is in terrible poverty. How do you change that with an energy paradigm that is, I hate to say it, I call them the petrofascists, have deliberately kept us in this state as the population now is about to hit 8 billion in about a month or two. Next. And we're going to play this, just so you get a sense, and you all know this, but it's to recap what's happening. And you look at this, you know, ice caps are melting, uh, the oceans are certainly going to rise, they could rise as much as 20 feet if, if we have the big ones uh, melt. We have all kinds of extreme weather events. You hear about every, you know, a uh, few weeks, a 500-year climate event. Remember? Sometimes a thousand year in the same area. And then another couple years is another 500 year event. And then we have this whole morass of how we're living, you know, on wires that we haven't needed. And so the entire system is set up to benefit a relatively small number of global oligarchs and financial interests that we absolutely have to say enough. They've had 150 years to do this. So as you look at all of this, all the deforestation, all the ocean damage, the coral reefs dying, it's all avoidable. The good news is it can be fixed very quickly. And so these are the issues. Like here you have a coal mine. Why are we digging stuff up out of the ground when we haven't needed to burn coal since about the 1920, 1930 time period? Here's your solar panels. I had to replace my solar panels with high more, and they all end up in a landfill, and they're toxic. <laughs> you 
You know, we're working in a paradigm, whether it be fossil fuels or what is being proposed as new energy, that isn't going to work. <laughs> Endless, you know, you read, see the book years ago, Autogeddon, and you have lithium fields. You can't believe your lithium battery. I have an electric car plug-in. The amount of pollution from these lithium mining operations for lithium-ion batteries in your Tesla, not to mention they catch fire periodically. Now, fair enough, I'm an emergency and trauma doctor. Gasoline cars catch fire more. <laughs> I, I can tell you some horror stories, which I'm sure you don't want to hear. But these are the kinds of things that are going to keep happening and keep happening and keep happening and have been avoidable. Look at this in the oceans. Most of you know that there are these nanoparticulate plastics that are in the entire food chain. They cause cancer. They disrupt hormones. They damage your brain. And why? Well, if we had, quote, unquote, free energy systems from what we're going to describe, this zero-point energy field, you would never have to have anything wasted because you'd have 100% recycling because the cost of the energy would be zero. The rate limiting factor in most of this is the cost of energy. You get to the point of diminishing return when you're trying to recycle. And then we have all these famines happening around the world because of the absolute social injustice of a system that is driven by greed and uh, limited, scarce resources. When, as Tesla pointed out, there's an infinite amount of energy to be tapped in what has now been quantified as the zero point energy field. Visualize this as you see these images of both new energy solutions, quote unquote, and the old guard. If you see a, a coffee cup, the volume of space in a coffee mug has enough, in that space, volume of space, enough energy to, run, to boil off all the oceans of the earth. It's been quantified. How do you tap it? Now, mainstream science says it can't be tapped. It's there theoretically. Not true. And you're going to find out how untrue that is. And so this just goes on and on and on. Um, now we have the nuclear problems, the deep horizon disasters. The, and how many of these have to happen before we do something effective? Now, I will give a pass to everyone who doesn't know about the fact that there are technologies that would solve this problem. But once you do know, you cannot turn your back on this. So now I'm putting a very heavy burden on all of you. Everyone at home, the 10,000 or so people by webinar, and all of you guys, that we have a responsibility once we know what this information is to do everything. I left my medical career to do this and get this fixed for our children and our grandchildren. Next month, my 12th grandchild will be born. <laughs> Hard to believe. but. What a journey, huh? So I think that when we look at this, and we can go to the next uh, series, look at this. How long ago was it recognized that this was a disaster? Senior scientist Exxon, 20, it, this is, excuse me, 45 years ago. There's a scientific agreement that global climate through carbon dioxide is, you know, this problem. And... So you, people think that you know, we're doing study after study after study. Well, 45 years on, after it was a known problem, and actually it was known before then, this is insanity. This is a, a civilization gone mad. Next. So one of the problems is that many scientists, such as myself, have discovered that there are very concerted, well-oiled machines to provide false information even to scientific and academic programs, it's called capture, where they try to rationalize away this problem and everything's fine. Many talk show hosts will say, we have hundreds of years of fossil fuels in America. And that's true, we do. But the Earth can't stand hundreds of years more. It can't stand another 20. I'll tell you right now, you don't have 20 years. The other issue is that that's assuming that the only people on Earth that need to have energy and air conditioning and cars and modern life are the 4% of people who are living in America of the world's population of 8 billion. 4% of 8 billion is 320 million. It's about what we have. So that's not a, a very compassionate view either. Next. And then look at this. We have, we'll just roll through these one after the mammal diversity. 
you know, it's going down, you know, completely off the cliff. But you were losing our, our bio genome, we call it. Next. And we have this mass extinction event. That this is the sixth great extinction that's happening on the planet. And it's 100% man-made. All of it. So this is a huge problem. And we have to all awaken. Because what's happened, I think we're like a frog being boiled slowly in a pot and turning up the heat. And suddenly we're going to wake up and find out, you know, it's too late. We've gone over the, the, the boiling point. 150 species every day go extinct. Now, these aren't all animals. They're all kinds of species. Next. And then we have these huge problems that we mentioned earlier. The ice caps melting and all that that will entail that will then rise sea levels. And we're already seeing that all over the world. There are some islands that are having to be evacuated. Uh, and you're here... Your ocean's going to rise too. But this, here's, here's a case where the Canadian government ordered the scientists not to disclose the extent of it. So what you get in the media is, is a very sanitized version of this problem, which many people believe we may have already gone over the edge of the red line, how far we can go without a safe return to a sustainable civilization. Next and this is one of my favorite points that came out. And they had an article in The Economist. Three billion people. Put this just for a moment. Three billion people, almost half the world's population, has no way to cook their food. They have no way to heat. But what they're doing, they have to just survive, is cutting down the rainforest and cutting down the scrub and shrubs in the desert. You have what's called the desertification, where you have the growth of deserts going on exponentially. You can take maps from, you know, 40 years ago and now and just see the growth of this de dead zone growing. Why? You have 3 billion people that don't even have, even if they had access to fossil fuels, they don't have access. This is how they're living. Next. And this is even happening in Europe. I mean, Germany may freeze this winter because of the gas pipelines being cut off when we haven't needed gas pipelines for 100 years. Keep, keep that in mind. And here you have over a billion people who don't have access to potable water. Next. And then we have this. Those of us in the Western world are feeling the pinch of what's happening with these prices. And I don't think we've seen anything yet. And if you look at what's going on in Europe in the next image, <laughs> we're talking 800% increase in energy prices. It's become a huge crisis around the world. There are riots happening. Now, it's really sad because here we are dependent on transmission lines, fossil fuels, nuclear power plants. We'll get to this in a minute. When the solutions are there and they're being classified and seized by the patent office, etc., which we will prove in a moment. Next. And, of course, this is another problem. Everyone thinks, you know, if we plug in enough cars which are being fueled off of coal-fired and gas-fired power grid, right, 88% of it. When you plug in your Tesla or my new electric Jeep, which is a fun toy. We'll get to this and I'll show you a picture. But it, it's coming. Well, you know, boys and their toys. You know, they just get my... <laughs> but it's not a solution at all. Except mine runs on a solar panel when it works. I'll show you this. I'll show you this in a minute. That's when. It, here's big in caps. When it works. <laughs> Next. <laughs> so then we have this, you know, issue, of course. I mean, this is now we're at the point of saber-rattling the nuclear weapons, which we thought, those of us who grew up in the Cold War, thought, ah, that's over. No, it didn't. You have an unstable dictator who's now threatening to use them tactically on the battlefield. Um, and yet, when we look at this, you look at how much of the energy comes from there for Europe. Not, you know, coal from the Ukraine, gas from Russia, etc. So what happens, there's a geopolitical crisis. And let me translate for you when they talk about our national security interests in XYZ territory. National security interests translate as a three-letter word, oil or gas. That's it. That's what they're talking about. What is our national security interest in the Middle East except that, that there are these big lines of super tankers coming out of the oil states. Same thing here. Next. 
And then we have this problem. Not only is China, but India is trying to electrify, which they want to have lights, they want to have computers, they want to have heat or air conditioning and car. Well, they're trying to do this, but they're building enormous, unscrubbed coal-fired power plants. Same in China. There's a, an estimate of up to a thousand of them are on the drawing board. So we could all get rid of everything we're using fossil fuel in this country, if you could wave a magic wand and we're 4% of the world's population, you have these areas that are billions of people who are building and building and building coal-fired power plants, but without the scrubbers. They're not taking, I mean, our coal-fired power plants are relatively pristine by comparison. Huge problem. Time bomb. Next. And this, this is 9 million, do the math, 9 million people a year are dying of starvation. So that's 1.5 times the number of people who died in the Holocaust, all in World War II, dying every year. So if we care about our fellow humans and the planet together, we're going to have to figure out a solution that is way beyond anything Washington is talking about or Silicon Valley is talking about. Next. And then there's this. The pesticides and other chemicals have dropped our sperm count down by 52%. Now, I will tell you as a medical doctor, you can only get it so low before you're, you, you become infertile. You know, it's a really a big crisis. And they've done studies in parts of the Midwest where they use a lot of specific types of chemicals and pesticides. It's more than this because it's in the water table from the soy fields and everything else. It's an enormous problem. And many of them, the reason for it, just a real quick scientific point, many of those chemicals, which we don't, shouldn't be using, and wouldn't need to with, you'll see at the end of this presentation, those are all systems that interrupt your endocrine, hormone, and all of that. And so there, many of them are uh, analogs of estrogen. They mimic estrogen. But if you're a guy, not a great thing, right? Next. And so what I like to point out, let's go to the next one here, is that both sides are right and both are wrong. Here's my solar panel. It's fun. Oops. Well, somehow we went backward. Let's go back. There we go. Um, so I have a solar farm. This is about half of it. So here's a little. I just I want to just make this a little personal story because I, I am not anti-environment at all. I'm the ultimate original environmentalist from since I was in, in middle school and high school. So I put this in. It's uh, the largest legally allowable solar farm in Virginia. It, believe it or not, they cap how big it can be. When I first put one in, it was 9.9 .9 kilowatts. Now they've raised it to 20-something, so I put in all new ones. And it, here's in the middle, you see this giant battery pack that's a backup power in case we lose power, because I live on this farm in Virginia, 65 acres, and we have storms and you lose power, so here's a backup. And here's my new little toy. <laughs> it's an electric plug-in Jeep. A lot of fun. And it can run off, it can charge it off the solar panels. It's fun. It's great. So I'm trying, you know, you try to walk the, the, the talk, right? But here's what happened. Put this new system in uh, last year, January, a few months ago. We have a one foot wet snow. It takes out millions of trees. Not only do, does the power go down for an entire week where we live near the University of Virginia, one of the top universities in the United States, but the solar the system collapsed, this, this whole solar farm. And once we got, they came out and cut it back up because it was such heavy, wet snow. All these batteries, and these are two feet, foot deep, deep cycle batteries that have to be replaced every eight years or so, which is also polluting, could provide us hot water, lights, internet, running water because we're on a well, and refrigeration, freezer, and some cooking. Not one zone of the house could run on heating and cooling. So we're there in the Stone Age with little fireplaces. You know, we're going to burn, have to chop up our furniture. I know that we have wood to, to stay warm. And then all the pipes are going to break. This is after spending. Now, I'm you know, okay. I'm a medical doctor. And this is, you know, a, a, a correct criticism of people who can afford a vehicle like I have and afford this thing that was $80,000 this solar farm, but most Americans, and never mind the rest of the world, can afford this. 
So it, it sort of, you know, it makes you feel good. You're trying to do something, but it doesn't work. <laughs> Even when you're willing to drop six digits, you know, $100,000, it does not work. There's not enough energy density. And then the state caps, I could put in two or three of these huge farms because I have 65 acres and a lot of meadows. They won't let you. Power company lobbyists. All right? Next. Next. I can't hear me in the back. So I always liken this. We're living in this sort of comical, the Truman Show. I love Jim Carrey, and he, he's quite interested in a lot of this. And uh, But if you don't remember the movie, it's this guy grows up in this sort of staged environment, and it slowly discovers it's all a staged kind of fake set. <laughs> His whole life has been this staged event. It's a perfect metaphor for the world we're living in now where one political spectrum or one group uh, will say this and the other that. And, you know, the people who are saying we need more oil, gas, and coal until we get something to replace it, they're right. <laughs> Look what's happening all over the world. On the other hand, the people who say we can't just keep in drill, baby, drill, and burning oil and gas and coal because we're destroying the biosphere. And they're right. Now, when both sides are right and both sides are wrong, someone's been had. We've been had by people who want to deceive us and think that we're, we're actually having a, a, a legitimate debate about energy and the environment. We are not having a legitimate debate. We're all Jim Carrey living in this Truman show of a construct that is very contrived. The mainstream media, the political parties, Washington, all of them have, are, are pushing this agenda in many cases, they have no idea there's an alternative, which is what we need to change. But there are people, prime movers in those institutions, who do know. And we know who they are. And they know damn good and well that there are technologies that would replace all the current alternative energies that aren't working yet enough to save the planet and the fossil fuels. But as they have told me, we view the medicine worse than the disease. Why? Because you're talking about the, something like $800 trillion in assets. Gone. I was talking to a big mutual fund manager, uh, has a couple trillion dollars that they manage, about the fact that they're going to have to move their assets in the next few years when we bring this out, because we're going to do it. Next. Here we have another issue. Now, almost 9 million people dying of premature deaths. And I have two close friends who are older than me that have died in the last year or year and a half who have died of lung cancer even though they never smoked a cigarette or anything in their life. It's this. It's the toxicity of the air we breathe. But globally, I mean, as bad as Los Angeles can be, you go to New Delhi, you go to Beijing, you go to some of these other, and it is way worse. I mean, the air here is pristine by comparison. Same thing with this, lung cancer, and next, this. So everyone's saying, well, you know, we don't have enough fossil fuels coming out, and the density of energy from solar and wind isn't enough, fast enough, so let's build more of these. Well, then you're stuck with one million years of toxic, life-killing waste from nuclear reactors. Next. Now let's look at this. This is just a great graphic. Most people think when you are doing a nuclear power plant is running that you're somehow getting energy from the atom directly. No. You're, you're, what you're doing is splitting the atom, as it were, creating a lot of heat that boils water, heats water, it turns a steam engine like a choo-choo train in 1849 coming out to the gold rush in California. That's all a nuclear power plant is. You are not getting energy from the atom. You're just boiling water and heating up water, which the steam turns a turbine, and electricity comes out, like a water wheel or a hydroelectric dam, except you're stuck with a million years of waste. Most people, if you went on the street, most people do not know that that is all it is. It's basically a boiler. All right, like in the 1800s. Next. And here I make it, you know, this is funny. Because here's 1804, 
<laughs> chugga, 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 steam. And now this is 2022. So we think this is a high-tech solution. Nuclear. It isn't. Next. And this is the other problem. The distribution of the power from the point that you have the primary source by the time you generate it, transmit it through the inefficient transmission lines, and then the, your, your wiring in your device or your home, you've lost at least 66%. So 66% of the energy is completely wasted. I mean, this is bizarre, right? Next. And so now you're facing this. <laughs> you have an electric car? Well, you can't plug it in all the time because the grid's going to come down. You're going to have brownouts and blackouts. It already happened this year. And imagine if all 40 million people in California had electric cars trying to charge them. Your grid would collapse. They're not replacing it with renewables at nearly the pace of these supposed solutions. Elon Musk doesn't want me to tell you that, but it's the case. It's true. Next. And we, we do cover this. Look at all these lithium in the Atacama Desert. Just, you know, a huge mining operations that are destroying that environment. Next. And just look at what goes into a car battery. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Next. And we, we should just go on and on. Let's move through some of these. You get the picture. Um, and then we have the forced labor in China making many of these solar panels and uh, alternatives. So we may feel like we're doing it, but it's like we're supporting this. So here's your energy grid. 12% is a new renewable. The rest is the old system. So if you plug in your electric car, 88% of the power, because the grid is shared all over the United States, coming from gas and oil and coal. Now, this is something people are very depressed when they hear this, but I'm just, I'm not bashing on people attempting to fix the problem. I'm just saying it's a solution that isn't ever going to work. Not enough time. Next. And this is a, a point, you know, a lot of liberal general, journals have made the same point. It's simply not enough. It's too little, too late. Next. So here's what we're going to do. <laughs> I call this the mission to planet Earth. I, used, I briefed once a, a woman who was a PhD satellite imaging uh, person for NASA. He was, she's one of the five directors of NASA. And she worked for what was called the mission to planet Earth. And they were imaging the rate of, of damage to the biosphere and the ice caps. And this was back when I met with her in 1997. And she told me then, 25 years ago, if every person knew the rate of the collapse that we're, we're seeing, there would be, and I am quoting, widespread panic in the United States. Next. So these are the technologies. We're going to, this is going to be so much fun because we're going to take a tour all over the world and we're going to start with uh, these are, are technologies that you know, many people think it started with Nikola Tesla. A lot of it did, by the way, but he wasn't the only one. Next. But I love this quote. If you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. Now, the reason he said that is that when you use what's called a very high voltage system at certain frequencies, physicists listen, and, and, and engineers, you can tap in to what Professor Casimir called the zero-point energy field. Some people call it the quantum vacuum. Other people, like Professor Dirac, modestly called it the Dirac C. The point is, <laughs> the point is, and, and, and a lot of modern physicists describe this negative energy field that is much more energy and matter in the universe than the matter and energy we think of. And we just tested a device last month in the Arizona desert, you'll see in a moment, that is based on that. Next. So he had, you all know Wardenclyffe in 1904, he did wireless transmission of energy, but he was also pulling energy out of the ambient magnetic flux field and the quantum flux field. Now Tesla didn't understand, it had not been quantified and studied by physics, but here's a thing that you have to understand about science, 
And most scientists, this is a little secret they don't want you to know. Many things are based on empirical or direct observation. And maybe a century later, they understand how it worked. Most of you don't know that aspirin, we didn't know the mechanism of action for aspirin for 100 years. Just recently, we got uncovered how it's actually operating. So many times we will have a phenomenon and they won't understand how it works. But it doesn't mean it's not working because it may be 100 years before our instrumentation, our knowledge and information gets to the point where they go, ah, that's what that's doing. Digoxin from Foxglove, which we treat used for congestive heart failure, was used for 100 years. No one knew how it was actually increasing the contraction and strength of the heart muscle. That was just not too long ago discovered and figured out, but it worked. Similarly here, he had great concepts about it, but they've become much more developed in more recent uh, decades. This was 1904. Next. And here we have a car from 1921 running without a plug. Now look at this old car. And it was pulling energy out of, they just said, out of the environment. They, didn't, they couldn't quantify what, but they had the correct frequency. And this had a battery and some wiring. And it was running, 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 running around without being plugged in. Uh, memo to Tesla Motors. Go and research this. And get rid of your plug-ins. Next. And this is one of my favorite. 1902. An old, a farmer and, and engineer named Stubblefield with Tesla. He had something they called the Earth Battery. Or the Stubblefield Battery. And it had rods going into the Earth and some wiring. And it was picking up this magnetic flux field of the planet and he was running his farm and Tesla was there with him 1902 so when I say 100 years lost century no this is why we need to reclaim this the sub caption for this film is the lost century how to reclaim it how do we get this century back how do we go back to the future in a sense and this is why <laughs> next you will see here we have all the methods. I want to review these very quickly. We have, and, and th th these are some, some of these are common sense, but every one of these are ones I have encountered and investigated personally with geniuses, engineering geniuses, and physics geniuses, but strategically impaired inventors. Black shelving. So someone comes along, they offer you $20 million for your device, it's a corporation, they put it on a shelf. Boom. Hey, it's cartels and corporations do it all the time with patents and other things. But in this case, it's killing the planet. And we have many cases of this. National security orders. We're going to show you one from a man we just met with. An actual one with his name taken off because he's afraid. Patent seizures. Financial entanglements from investors because they're doing their whole business and legal strategy wrong. Legal entanglements where they end up in court. Threats to the individuals, all many of these people, I had a guy under contract building one, all you had to do is have some thugs come in and say, you, your wife, you're dead, you stop this. And he stopped. We'll hear this in a moment. And then scientific fraud. Great example, Pons and Fleischmann, Eugene Malov, MIT, PhD, saw MIT falsifying, falsifying the results of that test where they did verify it worked. And then you have a really big one, media corruption. Well, why doesn't everyone in the world know these things have existed? Because, as you'll see in a little bit, the media, at a certain high level, have operatives from the intelligence community who kill stories on demand. And then the worst, of course, wet works, which is stuff we've had to deal with. That's a CIA term. Wet works are uh, wet from blood. It's assassinations. Next. So here you have an actual seized FBI document. And uh, this is the FBI going into Tesla's house. And the Department of Defense, if you go to the next slide, you'll see, is demanding they turn over what they seized in 1943. Now, this used to be an urban myth. Oh, well, he had these secret inventions and papers, and the government stole it. No, it's right here. This is a... Uh, there's the provenance of this document is known. So they go in, the FBI takes it, and here the Department of Defense, years later, is saying, we want all those papers that you confiscated in 1943 upon Nikola Tesla's death.
So the other thing that happens is the archives and the scientific papers get confiscated and they vanish into the black pit. Next. And then you have just flat out patent confiscation through the national security orders. Look at this. This is 12 years ago. 5,135 inventions seized under national security orders. All right? And this is under the 1951 Act, and it's still being abused. In 1971 list includes patents for solar voltaic that were subject to restriction because they were more than 20% efficient. The most efficient solar panel you can get right now in 2022 is 22.8%. These were way past that in, how many years is that? 51 years ago. And though, okay, we're not talking about an extraterrestrial spacecraft or anti-gravity or gravity control. We're talking about just a super efficient solar panel. Those are confiscated. Here's, and this is a mainstream scientific organization saying this. Of course, the media didn't want to cover this. And so, the, uh, the, the, this is one of my favorite statements of this report. One may fairly ask if disclosure of such technologies could really have been detrimental to the national security or whether the opposite would be closer to the truth. But again, what does national security mean here? Oil, gas, petrodollar, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan Chase, that's the national security in the abused, corrupt system. Next. So here we have a man. Luckily, before he got put under a gag order, uh, he was fired, Dr. Tom Vallone, his PhD physicist. He was a patent examiner, and he saw these amazing technologies being confiscated. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is absolutely proven. And he blew the whistle. They fired him. So he ended up suing them for being wrongfully terminated. But I, we, the interview we have, and it's on our YouTube channel, and it's in the Disclosure Project material, he goes through the whole way that that happened and how they would you know, kind of shunt over to another office anything that could impact the sort of the status quo of oil and gas and coal and public utilities. Boom. Put over here. And he, he was horrified as a, as a scientist. You know, because he saw things that would save the planet. Now, this was way back in the 80s or 90s. But he came forward and has testified to this. Next. And as we begin to go through these devices, I would just want to keep you in mind, we're just going to do, like, there are hundreds and hundreds of them. So, you know, T. Henry Moray had a device, no input energy, once he got it set up, output 50 kilowatts. Um, but, but he had multiple assassination attempts and finally was bankrupted in his lab. This was the 1930s. Next. Here's a friend of mine. He was a Wright-Patterson, Project Blue Book guy. But when he retired, he built a device that you could put on the air intake of a car. This is in the 80s, where you would get uh, anywhere from 20 to 40-some percent more range, miles per gallon, on conventional. This is not a free energy device. And reduce the emissions up to 70 percent. I have the patent. I have the Department of Transportation test by the U.S. government verifying it. He had his lab vandalized, everything stolen, bomb threats, etc. This is a colonel who put his entire life savings into something in the 80s that would have been a game changer. But it wasn't a free energy device. It wasn't something just running out of the zero point. It would have just gotten more efficiency and cleaned up the air. And that caused what I call murder incorporated to threaten this man. And this guy, no crackpot. He is serious, World War II hero, and then worked in Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Next. This gentleman actually took a device from a Russian immigrant and another and kind of packaged it. He didn't actually understand it that much. And he had one that was, look at this, how much energy it was putting out. It was based on a resonant field kind of uh, harmonic. Next. And you had 26, almost 27 watts going in, 7,460 watts going out and tested and verified by multiple labs long time ago. 
Now, unfortunately, this disappeared because he actually took the ideas from some geniuses and was trying to make a lot of money. And so his became, I'm calling this, inventor syndrome. And I, I, I sort of jokingly call it crazy inventor syndrome. Uh, it's not very nice, but I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy. And here's why it's crazy. Because what people do is that they will, <laughs> they think, and we're going to get to this in a moment, they think I have the, the, the best thing since sliced bread, and the world's going to be the path to my door. And they don't realize they're going to have corrupt interests from the national security state, corporations, and all kinds of other people stop them. So they think they're going to do a normal investment and normal venture capital and patent it or keep the secret sauce of how it works away from everyone. And in every single case for 100 plus years, they've taken that knowledge to their grave. This is we got to fix. And we'll get through the strategy. And this is so beautiful. We're going to play this in a minute. You know who this is. And I say, what happens? They get indoctrinated with this idea that I'm going to get rich quick. And I'm going to do this like you're invited the intermittent windshield washer and made a billion dollars. A guy did. Or, you know, a new cell phone or uh, whatever. Or a software program. They don't realize you're making a run at the foundation of a global macroeconomic power system that has a thousand times the wealth and power of the United States government. And this is how they think right here. <laughs> so, having done that for 31 years now, I have been dealing with people with these devices since 1991. And almost all of them fall into some part of this syndrome. And it's a tragedy. Because we, you will see them, you'll see the device, I'll have engineers come in and test it, they go, oh no, I'm going to keep it secret, nobody can know but me. And I need to make a bunch of money. They want to be the next Rockefeller of energy. And the next thing you know, they're dead, or the device is confiscated, or it vanishes in a buyout. So this guy had the same problem. This is, you go to, uh, in Switzerland. He had a device. They have it there still running. And, but they think that no one can know this but them. And so they keep it secret. It's all secret. They're buying into the paranoia. My answer is, open source it. Dump it on the internet, blockchain, or any way you can. You have no patent, no intellectual property. The whole world knows about it, and every scientific lab in, in the world can reproduce it. We're going to get to this strategy in a minute. That's how we go. we got to do that. Because the very definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. That's attributed to Einstein. But how true is that here? You know, but most of these scientists and inventors that are working in labs and or Lawrence Berkeley labs, like one guy I know, they discover this. They have no idea what the national security implications are, meaning oil and money. They have no idea the buzzsaw they're about to go through. And I hate to say it, pride goeth before a fall. It's just a disaster for them. And they don't see it coming until it's too late. So we have to change our strategy. This man's a CIA officer. I knew, but he had approached me years ago. And uh, next, he had, uh, interestingly, took... Next, I guess they can't hear me back there. Um, uh, <laughs> oh, we'll just freeze here. I thought there was another slide for him. He had taken a man that you'll see in a moment, John Bedini, into an old retired schoolhouse up in the upper Midwest. I know where it is. And this guy who was a CIA operative, actually had a device that he enticed John Bedini with. And Bedini was an electromagnetic engineer, had worked in some black projects in his early days. And he has recently passed away uh, rather suddenly. But he was taken there. They said, okay, they had all these file cabinets and devices stored in this remote place that had been confiscated from the late 1800s and early 1900s up until when he was there in the 80s. And they brought in a, co a copy, or trying to recruit him, the agency, this officer, was trying to pull him into their program. And they said, we'll let you copy 
any of these documents and patents that we've confiscated. And the devices were there. I, I knew John Badini. I was at his lab. And it's so long as you play with us, you join our team, the covert team. Badini said no doing. They roughed him up, almost killed him. But this guy, Sajeka, there is a disk. It's encrypted. And the man who created it for us has died. But it has hundreds or thousands of pages of these confiscated patents and designs for these devices that were in that facility. We have it. I have it. I need a good decryptor right now. Uh, next, this one I love because jo Joseph Newman, this story is fascinating because he had a, a tiny, you know what 17 watts, it, like a, you know, a 20 watt light bulb. It was putting out 200 watts. So there you have something that's, you know, what is that, you know, 15 times. 10 to 15 times more output than input. And this is in the 80s. This is 40 years ago. And here's what happened. He kept the whole thing so secret. It was going through a patenting process, but even the patent application left out a lot of the secret sauce. Most of these inventors do this. Fatal mistake. And what happened is that it was all covered up, that he actually was taken to court. Patent office said, even though he had proof that it worked for multiple very esteemed scientists, patent examiners, there was a, a master appointed for the court that proved that the thing actually did as he said it did, and he got nowhere. He took this to his grave. Look at this video that you're going to see in a moment. Mr. Newman has been fighting for a patent for years. Many, therefore, considered it ironic when a federal judge appointed the former head of the patent office, William Schuyler, to decide if Newman's device did or did not work. Mr. Schuyler, who is also considered to be an expert on electrical engineering, didn't take long to make his decision. In a report of the special master, Mr. Schuyler states, evidence before the court is overwhelming that Newman has built and tested a prototype of his invention in which the output energy exceeds the external input energy. Therefore, there is no contradictory factual evidence. For the layman, that means the machine works. The expert then goes on to say, the Patent Office finding that such a machine is impossible is clearly erroneous. Mr. Schuyler also found that the Patent Office intentionally did not consider the formalities of Mr. Newman's application for a patent. Why wouldn't you go along, again, with a master that's former head of the, the uh, Patent Office, who has credentials that the uh, judge called outstanding, why wouldn't you go along with the man that you recommended in granting a patent? You ask mean questions, don't you? I think you'd have to address that question to our present commissioner. Are you acting on his orders? You might say that, yes. There you go. Here's an admission. This is CBS News. It's almost 40 years ago. And the key point here is this man, like most of these, the ones who were still living when I got involved, you know, I remember I've been briefing people like the director of the CIA since 1993. This guy called me up. He said, we really need your help. And I said, the only way you're going to do this is that you disclose it, all of it, open source it, get it out there. I will see that we get it out to the entire scientific community. He says, no, no, no. I, it's Gollum, my precious, my precious, my precious. And I said, dude, you're, you're going to take this to your grave. He took it to his grave. Yep, it's gone. Nobody knew that secret sauce. Here we have a brilliant uh, device, again, almost 40 years ago. Look at the input and output. Tested over and over again, 0.3 milliwatts. Output, 2,223,000. 223, watts. That's 22.4 kilowatts. That's plenty to run your car, your, your Tesla motor. Now, continuously output, if, if needed, on demand. So this little thing that looks like a cigarette pack, when he died under mysterious, they said a heart attack, and he was elderly, but he had had all kinds, it's all kinds of evidence he was killed. And that little thing that you're seeing him hold, we have testimony from someone who worked with him that we just filmed last month here in L.A. They were going to attack, he was working with General Motors, he could attach it to an electric motor, 300 horsepower. It's a pretty strong electric motor. By the way, electric motors, 
horsepower for horsepower have more kick than a gas one if you've driven electric cars. And that's when he, the unbelievable attempts at, on his life, threats. There were photographs taken inside his house. He didn't see how those people got in there. His uh, materials were confiscated. And unfortunately, even C Lieutenant Colonel Bearden, who worked in this area for years and was been on my team for years, he never would disclose to anyone how this really worked. He took it to his grave. How many times does this have to happen? Next. And I just mentioned the, the Fleischmann and Pons cold fusion. Now, it didn't put out a lot of power, but what was scary is that this is 1989. It made the you know, cover of all the magazines. The way they took that avenue of discovery out of the scientific world is that there were people who were paid, who were corrupted, through scientific fraud at MIT. Next slide. Dr. Yuji Malov, dear friend of mine, I would take the vices, he would test PhD, Harvard, and MIT, brilliant man. And he was at MIT in the, the science office for education when he saw how they had changed the data on the reproducing the Pons Fleischmann experiment. And he blew the whistle. And it was, you know, it was hell on wheels. But of course, that whole story got pushed under the carpet, sort of covered up. He, kept, he and I kept working on this. He finally gets someone who brings him a, a zero-point device, solid state, no moving parts. And I said, Gene, we need to get this out to the public very quickly. Oh, no, they want to keep it secret. I begged him, and I begged him, and I begged him, and I begged him. He was beaten to death when he was over at his parents' home and was killed, murdered. Made to look like some thugs. They were, yeah, they were thugs, but they were. It wasn't a random murder, and the device vanished with him. Good friend of mine, dear friend. Next, this gentleman. This goes way back, 80s and 90s. Now, I like this story. I want to tell you something about this. We could do a whole hour presentation on this because I was intimately involved. After he passed away, this inventor. He had a car that would run on water, but it had to be modified. And he always kept that secret. He had a patent that he falsified the voltage and the frequency, cycles per second, on the electronics because he didn't want anyone to reproduce it and leapfrog him financially. Again, this crazy inventor syndrome. And what happened, and when he passed away, there was a whole warehouse full of floppy disks and papers and everything. And his heirs wanted to sell it off. So I got invited in, and my science advisor, who was a professor at the University of New Hampshire, went, he went there. And what people didn't realize is that this car was the least important thing Stan Meyer had. He had a toroid. And the Toro, it was a donut-shaped electromagnetic device that had had a national security order slapped on it. Because I was going to get it and openly disclose it. Because, I won't tell you why, those guys know they don't tangle with me. You know, clean their clock. So, <laughs> I'm nice until I'm not nice. And I won't tell you how that goes. But, <laughs> yeah, just be, be, no, be, be aware. So, what happened... <laughs> I, I used to have, you know, gang members with, you know, tech tens in the ER with, in my face telling they're going to kill me. I go, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, these light and the loafer guys at the agency. So, from Yale. Um, sorry. But I'm going to go off, off script a bit here. But, so he had this. Now, what people didn't realize, at the time, I knew that this was a disaster. Because I only had a limited amount of money at that time. Um, in my project. We had a few hundred thousand we were going to offer, but we made it clear we were going to open source it. Well, they had a group, an engineering group from Michigan come in, the heirs for Sam Meyer's material, who had a lot more money because they had a big backer. And they were going to monetize it, keep it secret, try to repatent it, all the usual crazy ideas, and which would be great if you're just developing a new software program, but not something that's going to change the world forever. Can't do it. 
So those guys got it. And, you know, they were working on a couple years. I get this hysterical call from, I won't say who it is, a Lord somebody out of the British Isles. He says, Dr. Greer, we need your help. We need your help. It was hysterical. He had been the big, deep pockets funding that engineering group in Michigan. He says, they're on the run for their lives. They've been sabotaged. They've had death threats. So I wrote, I'll give it to anyone who needs to see it, a three, I think a three or four page strategic paper, what they needed to do within 24 hours. And my advice was, forget about Gollum and be in my ring and my precious ring. In this case, it was literally a precious ring. Toroid. Donut-shaped thing. And just put it out there. I will help spread it. We will build these up independently, have labs tested, and every A-list celebrity I know will have their house and their car running on it. And you cannot put that toothpaste back in the tube. You squeeze it hard enough. He says, yes, that's, uh, you're right. It's probably the only way. But they think they can find a safe country to go to. I said, you're going to have to go to another star system, my friend. I literally said that. No way that's going to happen. So, sure enough, I find out a few months later, I'm meeting with a, a high-tech guy in Orange County, that entire team was assassinated. Was one, the one survived. Uh, it was just crying like a baby in this man's office. And I said, you know, I'm trying to, you know, get, you know, can you imagine the frustration, 31 years of this, that I've gone through. But this guy really did have a car around water. <laughs> and, of course, the exhaust is what? Water vapor. So you split H2O with the hydrogen and oxygen, and the exhaust is water vapor, but the magic is something else. Next. He was murdered. He took a, he, he was poisoned when he was meeting with a bunch of CIA people. An Listen to this. Dream becoming a reality. A local inventor has discovered a way, hear this, to use water to run your car. <laughs> It's a major breakthrough that will no doubt make motorists happy. And as Ralph Robinson explains, the Pentagon is also showing lots of interest in this project. Oops. Water has always been considered a precious commodity, but Stan Meyer's invention may make it even more valuable. He has developed what's called a water fuel cell. It has taken the place of his old gas tank. The water fuel cell breaks down water molecules into oxygen and hydrogen. The hydrogen is used to run his dune buggy. I don't care if you use rainwater, well water, city water, ocean water. If you don't have any fresh water, go ahead and use snow. If you don't have any snow available to you, then use salt water because there's no adverse effect to the fuel cell. Meyer started working on this project four years ago. He's not a scientist. He isn't even a chemist. In fact, he never graduated from college. Myers was determined, he says, to design something to protect this country from oil embargoes. And we have calculated that if we take the dune buggy from Los Angeles to New York, we would roughly use 22 gallons of water. The Pentagon flew over the Pentagon in number. last week to look at Myers' invention. There's talk of possibly using it in the Star Wars defense program and to run army tanks. Myers is currently perfecting a water fuel cell for cars. It will cost about $1,500. He says it won't need any maintenance and you won't have to replace it. It'll be at least two years before the fuel system goes into mass production. The day it happens will be one the fuel industry hates but it'll put a smile on the face of those who've had to say at one time or another, fill her up. I'm Ralph Robinson. As you can see, many patents have already been received, and many more are forthcoming. To date, over 42 patents have been applied for. Yeah, okay. So this, this sort of encapsulates, you know, five or ten of the suppression techniques, all the way from murder to crazy inventor syndrome, falsifying your patent, trying to make money first instead of proving the science first, etc. And, of course, he took this to his grave. He was poisoned and killed at a cracker barrel. An ignominious death, if ever I heard one. And, and it's lost to posterity now because the people who outbid my group, they didn't have any big financial backers. They got it, and it's all vanished now, and they're all dead. So that's what's happened. Then we have this brilliant man. He passed away a few years ago. This physicist had developed these what charged clusters. And basically what they are, they've been likened to little, tiny, microscopic ball lightnings. And when you discharge them, and this is what Stan Meyer, we're going to get this in a moment, is what Stan Meyer was doing. He didn't know it. It actually taps into and cavitates creates a path into this 
infinite zero point energy field, this vast amount of energy field. And that's why when he said, I'm doing, when Stan Meyer said you can take 22 gallons, there's not enough hydrogen and oxygen in 22 gallons of water to go across the United States. It's because most of the energy that was firing the pistons was coming from the zero point. I said that back in the 90s. He didn't know it. But I said, no, what he's doing with a very high voltage VHV system is that he was, he didn't know it on a micro, on a nano level, like it's been proven recently, where I show you, that he was getting energy only partially from burning hydrogen and oxygen. Most of the motive force and energy was actually coming from this, these tiny microscopic ball lightnings that would discharge and would cause a force, an energy force, that would move the piston, right? And he didn't know that. Now, this guy, he had a better idea. He actually proved his technology at the University of Illinois and also a university in Tokyo. I personally met with the CEO of his company back some years ago in Washington in the early 2000s. And at that time, Richardson, the Secretary of Energy, he'd been governor of New New Mexico was the Department of Energy uh, Cabinet Secretary for Bill Clinton. And so I, I met with this CEO, and he says, yes, they approved a $5 million grant from DOE so we could develop this further because one of the effects it had that they were really pursuing was putting low-level, initially, radioactive waste in these charged clusters, and it would cause isotopes that were non-radioactive to be created. What does this mean? and clean up all the radioactive waste. However, the phenomenon, the reason it was doing it was that it was actually activating, as it were, this baseline energy field that's at the fabric of space and time. And that's what they didn't want out. So in the rarest of events, that grant was published and these vicious people who want to keep all this stuff secret went into the, the, the Secretary of, of Energy's office and said, pull that grant. And they pulled it. And I met with the CEO of his company and said, we're out. That's what happened to this. Next. And this, I mentioned John Bedini, but he had, a, I was at his lab, 50 watts in and 772 watts out. We saw it, tested it. Now again, he would publish things that were kind of not quite how to do it because he said, and I said, why don't you just disclose the whole nine yards? All of it. He says, I've been roughed up and almost killed once. I don't want to be killed. So, and so he, he passed away you know, just a few years ago. Next. And then there's this wonderful man, a real hero of mine. He was the top scientist at the Naval Research Labs. So you'd have the director of the lab and then the, another person and this guy. I mean, he was always in the vice president's office and, and other places. And he actually brought me into the, the Naval Research Labs to see things that fly and float. You're going to see this in a minute. Um, Electrogravitic. High voltage systems that cause an electromagnetic field and things for flying. This guy is brilliant. He introduced me, to, and let's see the next slide, to a man at the, near the Redstone Arsenal. Now this man, I, I'm not going to use his name yet, but a few years ago I put him under contract to build a stationary, not flying, device so that we could at least have a level one device released to the scientific community and the public to get this ball rolling. And what was spooky about this is that, you know, I, he had stayed at my home, I'd been down there. He worked on, for IT&T under a contract, it was CIA, but they went through IT&T. What happened? So I go down there, I meet with his main shepherd. A shepherd is the guy who holds your clearance and security clearances. And he's a, he was a retired colonel and now a civilian. He says, so long as you don't do things that fly, because that's a missile delivery system, we'll get to that in a moment, he's been cleared to work with you on this. I said, great. So we give him a bunch of money, say, here, do this. <laughs> a few weeks later, he's setting up his lab, and I was, he has a SCIF, a secure communication information facility, in the bottom, underneath his house and at this place near Redstone. I've been at, but, so he, he, he starts putting this thing together. And the director of the CIA that I had briefed, who turned on us, 
Woolsey, went down there with some thugs and threatened him and his wife. And he's an engineer. You know, he's just your average middle-aged guy. He goes, I'm out. I'm out. So we lost all our money and didn't get a device either. But that guy was amazing. Now, the, the fascinating thing about Mr. Foch is that Foch, if he had been known in the public domain, would probably be the most accomplished aerospace guy of his generation. He passed away a few years ago of prostate cancer, unfortunately. Very dear friend. Um, <clears throat> but you read between the lines here. We've gotten so close, but the, 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 the fly in the ointment of what I did, and I didn't want to do it. What I wanted them to do is to hand off the information and let's open source it and this and that. He says, no, let's do it this way. And that was the last time I funded something like that. Because it's, it's, it doesn't work. It's got to be, from the minute you start experimenting with it, it's got to be live streamed, the whole damn thing. Every minute. You have to have the whole world, it's like in the 60s, the whole world's watching. The whole world's watching. That's what we have to do with this technology. Cannot run it like any other R&D project if you're going to actually get around this, these petrofascists. Um, next. And then you have this fantastic guy. <laughs> He's so amazing. He's a Harvard physicist. He had a fairly low temperature, I think two or 3,000 degree plasma, but highly magnetically charged. And those plasmas can tap into this energy field just like the little ball lightnings and this sort of thing. And we went down, went to his place. He was at that time outside Tampa. He had left Harvard. The thing was amazing. And it created, you could put waste material, like antifreeze or junk into this thing, like an incinerator, through this plasma. We saw it. And out would come just some carbon material and a type of magnetically charged gas, hydrogen gas that you could burn and run anything. Very clean. Very effect efficient. No emissions from the system. No pollution. So this is how you clean up the planet. You take all the garbage, run it through one of these things, it's just turned into a, some carbonaceous material. The outgassing of this magnetically charged gas runs factories, runs whatever. You don't need to fill landfills. This would have solved that problem. He couldn't get any help. He fled and went back to Italy. Very, very interesting story. Now, what he didn't tell people, my science advisor went in there. He says, here's something I can't put in a journal. Now, listen to this stuff. They, when they analyzed the effluent, the carbon and the sort of powdery stuff that came out, we saw it. They found platinum, gold, and other metals in it, even though none of that was in the stuff going in. And what he knew was happening, he was a physicist, is that the magnetic field of this particular very special plasma, which he also kept secret, would take, you know what an, you know, an atom, with its electron shell, it would cause the electron shell to kind of form a toroid, a ring. And the nuclei would be exposed, and they would recombine. It's transmutation of the elements, literally. Now, I know this has also been done in other projects. So, of course, that's a big story, because, you know, you're going to buy gold for 2,000 ounces. Well, actually, tick, 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 in certain frequencies, there you have it. Right? It's a whole new world coming. You're going to see this in a minute. Next. This is a man, Dr. Randolph Mills, another brilliant guy, had this company called Blacklight Power. It was all in the, in the media. It was basically using a type of, uh, not really cold fusion, but something similar with what he called hydrinos from hydrogen. Putting out 50 kilowatts of energy for only a, a one cent a kilowatt hour at cost, and at the cost of it. And it was no pollution at all. He had $100 million in funding placement. I begged him to open source it. I begged him to disclose it. I told him, you cannot do it this way. You have a $800 trillion gorilla that's going to stop you. Guess what? It vanished, and all the money, too. Next. Inventor syndrome. And here are the ones that we found that are that we <laughs> right now, they're operating right now, these people are not dead yet. Um, this first one, we were just there last month, about a month ago. So we had our, uh, our photography team and, and members of my team there. 
one, two, three, four, five, six magnesium alloy specially configured plates. This thing's the size of a nice size shoebox. The circuitry you see on the right is a misdirect because the guy has crazy inventor syndrome and thinks he can keep it secret and make a trillion dollars. This thing, for three years, had been sitting in this near a chicken coop in his backyard out in the desert, putting out three kilowatts of power continuously, and we cranked it up to five kilowatts. No input power. And it's running off the magnetic flux of the, uh, of, uh, of the space around it that he can tune to any place on the earth so it's correct, and boom. This thing, solid state, no moving parts. We just saw this. But he's a textbook case of making every wrong decision. He's worked on this for 40 years. 40. He's made every classic prima facie mistake. Pat, tried to patent it. Well, you'll see in a moment what happened. He ended up getting put in prison for a week. He had to go to court. He has had sabotage, death threats, murder of people around him. And now he's gotten in bed with some people who are giving him some money because a lawyer from Boeing, please listen carefully, he, you know, this, he just told us this a few weeks ago, calls him and says, here's the strategy you should use. So instead of releasing it so everybody could have this running their house, right, or your car, the guy says, build a megawatt plant out in the desert out here and sell the power to the grid, to the power company. Yeah, like that's going to happen? So that's what they're spending $5 million on right now. It's, it's as good as dead. Never going to go anywhere. And he's made all these mistakes, and I, I've tried to convince him, no, let's do it. Now, maybe if some backer came to me and said, well, let's just buy it out and open source it. Maybe he'd take it. I don't know. And here's the, here's the graphic, you know, how much energy he's putting out the amperage. It was five kilowatts. No wires going into it. Tested every one with meters. This thing is sitting there just running for years. It was running air conditioning. He was doing some other, I mean, it was this whole complex being run on this little thing. And, of course, the people I was with, we, I looked at them and I said, and they were holding their head. They got, this could save the, the humanity. This could save the biosphere. And it's, it's going to never get out. I said, this is what I've experienced for 31 years. You know, it gets old after a while, my friends. Next. And here's the secrecy order he was slapped with. <laughs> but look at the date. 1984. <laughs> it's almost 40 years ago. So, you know, doing the same thing, patent office, people think this is a myth. No, here's a secrecy order. It, because of the, the effect, you know, national security implications of what you have. Right? All right? This is, this is, he gave this to us. We took a picture of it right then and there at his place. Next. Now there's one in Florida that we had our engineer go down and test. This is the Holcomb Energy System. You can Google it. And this is now, and you know, you have, a, for any unit of energy, if you put a, 100 watts in, you get 500 watts out, solid state. All the ones I'm telling you have no moving parts. Some of the early ones were rotary and magnetic. These are no moving parts. And he's using electric steel, Dr. Holcomb is, and he's already had from what we understand, NSA people in there and other folks that are trying to buy him out or make deals with him. So that this system, very unlikely it'll run your house or business because strategically, this group right now is making every predictable error that you can make, every error. But it's phenomenal. Next slide. And here's an actual photo of the device, no moving parts. I think this one's a, about a 25 kilowatt. It'd run your house very easily. Nothing moving, continuously 25 kilowatts. So that's way more than you need on average for a house. Next. So as you see this, it, he sort of demonstrates this solid state system with the, the what he calls electric steel with a pulsed, electric voltage, high voltage system going in that actually causes it to resonate, begin to resonate with this whatever people want to call it, quantum vacuum, magnetic flux field, zero point energy field, and 
what's cool about it is that it's a very elegant system and it can be completely offline. But you can also hook it into the grid. And our engineers went down. Their thing is absolutely functional. And here's his patent. Next. And then there's the one I don't want to mention yet. We're trying to get up to this lab in Quebec. Um, big problem. But this is another one that puts out a thousand times more than you put in. It's based on resonance, but they have a software program that will align it so that as you're putting the frequency in, it taps into this environmental energy field of space-time, and it's running. No moving parts. But again, they're recently gotten in bed with Hydro-Quebec, one of the biggest power companies in Canada, and almost certainly this will be black-shelved. Um, it's very low likelihood he'll make it through the gauntlet. And they, the inventor and the business partner have no idea what the strategy should be, even though I've articulated it vociferously since June. But this device is very interesting. And by the way, many of these devices, and they were bragging about this, they have this software program that helps it, because it's very hard with an oscillating system to keep it tuned so it's tapping into that field continuously. But they also have it that if anyone tampers with it, it will self-destruct. The guy out in the desert in, in Arizona says, oh, yes, if anyone try to get in there and figure out what I'm doing, I'm keeping this really secret, it will reverse the polarity on the system. I won't tell you what that means, but basically it will burn it up. I said, great, a self-destruct button on something that will save the planet. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Next. And this is a man who's, you know, quite elderly, and this is a phenomenal system, patented. But it runs internal combustion engines on water with a little bit of gasoline in it so you don't have to modify the engine. It won't rust. So basically it can be 1% to 5% gasoline, the rest water. And this is an, a brilliant system. You could, this, what this means is... With Stan Meyer, you really had to have a different kind of engine and spark plug and all that. This, conventional spark plug, engine, all of it, because it has enough of the lubricant oil in it that it won't just freeze up the engine from rust and whatever. I won't go into all that detail. But the, he's still living. He's down south of Tampa also. Next. And this is really what he's doing. Takahashi, who is a, a scientist in, in uh, Japan, a few years ago proved that what Stan Meyer, this device, and many of the others, Ken Shoulders Charge Clusters, they're creating these small microscopic ball lightnings that when they discharge are tapping into that zero-point energy field and creating the mode of force. That's how on a very small amount of water, a tank of water, it's going across the continental United States. There's not enough hydrogen and oxygen in a tank of water to do that. Most of the energy is coming from this phenomenon, these, these sort of microscopic type of uh, ball lightning effects that when they discharge is just the right voltage and strength that it taps into that energy field. We understand it. I talked about this in the 90s and you know nobody thought that was true. Now it's been proven by uh, Professor uh, Takahashi. Next. And now we get into the really cool stuff. <laughs> so, you know, we're going to roll through this pretty quickly in the interest of time. But here we have, you know, look at the dates. 1919, Kalkowski Frost Experiment, where they actually had high-frequency systems where things levitated, defying gravity. And there was actually on the cover of a, a journal. Uh, science and invention. But it was, you know, with the, don't you love the picture of the babe floating up, you know, gravitation conquered at last? These are the actual journal, 25 cents. Um, next. And then T. Townsend Brown, famous work. It got pulled into covert programs way back 30s, 40s, 50s. And he had very high voltage systems, electrogravitic, they call it, where high voltage would cause this lift effect. And it would actually create, if you will, uh, a bubble, an electromagnetic field that would allow an object to move at enormous speeds and free of the forces of gravity, uh, what's called gravity control. Next. 
And this is a great quote from a, 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 this general. And he says, it sounds terribly screwy, but a Friday I went down uh, with Lair to a place called the Townsend Brown Foundation. And believe it or not, I saw a model of a flying saucer. Look at the date. 1952, 70 years ago. Next. And then we have Michael Schratt to thank for this, great archivist and historian. And he's found these are journals that date from the 50s, one, you know, 1956, where the big buzz in the aerospace industry was anti-gravity, quote unquote, the G engines, gravity engines. And this was actually in the open literature until they figured out how it really works and it all went black. Next. And my favorite letter of all times, the head of the Lockheed Skunk Works, Ben Rich. Look at the date on it. 1986. So, yeah, 36 years ago. I'm going to read it. Lockheed Advanced Aeronautics. He was head of the Skunk Works here in California. Yes, I'm a believer in both categories. It was an answer to a letter someone wrote and says, are these UFOs man-made or extraterrestrial? He says, many of our man-made UFOs are really unfunded opportunities, meaning if it was released for public use, it'd be an enormous industry. In both categories, there are a lot of kooks <laughs> and charlatans, so be careful. Ben Rich. But he says, many of our man-made UFOs. So he admitted in this letter that was found in... Uh, it was a great research, by the way, um, admits that a lot of these you're seeing, I opened with the Tic Tac and our jets. Every meeting I go in Washington, I said, see that thing you guys are all talking about? That's Lockheed Skunk Works. Next. And then we have this man who recently passed away. You may have seen him at the Disclosure Project Press Club, uh, where he debriefed the man who was at this air show here in California in 1988. So look at this. Next. God blessing, Mark McCandlish. Next. Within the intelligence communities, they have something called ace in the hole technologies. So secret they didn't even talk about it. November 12th of 1988 was their dog and pony show, a classified military exhibit at Norton Air Force Base. And then off in a separate section of the hangar behind a curtain, which was opened up once everyone had gathered, were three of these so-called alien reproduction vehicles, or ARVs. The craft itself was hovering off the floor with no landing gear underneath it, nothing supporting it from above. To see something, uh, you know, travel across 12 miles of airspace in under a second and a half, make a couple of right angle turns and not make a supersonic shock wave of any kind, no sonic boom, which I've personally witnessed on a number of occasions. I mean, it's just, it changes your whole perspective. <laughs> Next. So here's a, a, another great a graphic image of it. Next. By the way, these went all through the solar system. The components, Mercury era, 1959 to 19... 60s, early 60s. So these were operational. When did we master gravity control where these were being functionally built by classified projects here on Earth, not extraterrestrial? October 1954. Remember Rick Foch, the man I showed from the He was in the vault and saw the documents, and it stated what I just quoted. We mastered gravity control October 1954. So here we are riding on the surface of the roads and cars belching out garbage and pollution. When I say a lost century, it really is. Next. Here's the interior. It was manned. I have actually not on this craft, but I have interviewed uh, top secret people, pilots who have manned these man-made UFOs. This is a, had, I think it's seating for four. Um, and, you know, and through the 60s it had been around the solar system. It was not interstellar. Couldn't go faster than the speed of light, but it was pretty cool. Next. Another image. Next. So here we're just going to roll through these. I credit Michael Schraff for these. These are very good illustrations of actual eyewitness cases of everything you're going to see. Roll them. Man-made. Look at the date. 60s, 70s. Next. Just keep rolling them. <laughs> These are all man-made. Every one of them. 
I sent this recently to some senior intelligence people in D.C., and they said, oh, my God, incredible. They love this because they don't, you know, they're not read into these or briefed on their projects. It's our job. Um, <laughs> look at this thing. Big floating triangle. Look at all the grid work. So th those of you who go out and see something, if it has a superstructure with parts and rivets, it's man-made. The interstellar ones, the actual ET ones, have no seams. That's this very different critter. Next. And just keep rolling through them. You get the idea. And here's a great one. 95. So how can all this be true and we're still flying jets? Next slide. Now think about this. And rockets to space. This Elon Musk tweeted this out. That's all very comical. It's not comical when astronauts I know have friends that died in this. The Challenger tragedy. Here they are. Going up on a Roman candle 40 years, 50 years, 60 years after we already had gravity control. Objects that flew, no jet fuel, no rockets, they don't explode. I mean, this is, this is the biggest cover-up and scandal in the hist known history of the world. Full stop. And the, these guys on the launch pad fire this explosive stuff, and they died in 1967. Many of you may know this from history. Next. And then there's this. So during the Clinton years, I've done this for every administration since Bill Clinton I had some friends who were very close to the administration and knew the science advisor for Al Gore. And they go, would you please put together a briefing because they really, and, and, and Mr. Gore in particular, really wants to get these environmental problems solved, and you guys have an archive where you can prove this stuff exists. I said, okay. So we put all this together on a silver platter with a bow tied up, and they run the other way at the speed of light. They don't want to be killed. And I go, well, <laughs> here's a great quote from the Persian. The most despised of all men is the hypocrite. It's not enough to stand up in 06 and describe the problem that everyone knew in the 60s. When you've been offered the solution and the proof and you turn your back on it, no, sir. we got to call these folks. Everyone has to be held accountable for not doing the right thing because the earth is dying. Next and so then people get into, well, how can this be? I put this out a lot because it's a, a you know, not declassified document. But you have an organization called MAGIC, M-A-J-I, Majority Intelligence Committee, and a few others that run these covert projects. They are beyond black. What do I mean? They're unacknowledged special access projects. I'm sure you also unacknowledged. But these are the projects that are off the radar, even of the people who manage the black projects. So I call this Beyond Black. These are way off book. And this was a security alert with a distribution list back in the 90s. So I gave this 
some people in uh, the Pentagon, like Admiral Wilson, who I briefed, who was the head of intelligence, joined Chiefs of Staff, and they got inside the program. I'm doing that now for a whole new generation of people since the law was passed to do it, to get to the bottom of what UFOs are, or what they call now UAPs. Nobody calls them that. It's so ridiculous. Let me tell you what our UFO, UFA, they make up these fake names that are obfuscating, unexplained aerial phenomenon, like ball lightning or something. No, it isn't. First of all, it's not unexplained. Secondly, it's not aerial. And it's not just some phenomenon. They're either man-made UFOs or extraterrestrial. That's it. Keep it simple. So the reason you have to begin to do a little recap here is how could this be kept secret? Well, because, and this is, I was telling someone in backstage before I came on, the hardest thing for the senators and the White House people and the general public and particularly the media to understand, or scientists, is that if this is true, how could it be that it has been kept secret from the people? They're very good at counterintelligence. So it's structured, as Eisenhower warned us, beware the military-industrial complex. And when Senator Inouye of Hawaii said, there exists a secret government with its own Air Force, its own Navy, its own funding mechanism that's above the law and free from the law itself. Now, you can look that up. It's in our disclosure book. The point I'm making is this is a parallel universe. So get your mind around this. There is the government, constitutional government of the United States. And then there's this other secret government operation, which has more money, more power, more technology. But why? At the end of the briefing I have had with many of these generals and senators, and particularly this one admiral who was the head of intelligence joint staff, Admiral Wilson, there was a memo that leaked out about this. People, oh my God, did that really happen? I said, I told you it happened 20 years ago. Um, I don't make stuff up, friends. And what this guy said at the end of the briefing, I brought uh, astronaut Edgar Mitchell there because I was kind of mentoring him on all this back in the nine, 25 years ago. And he goes, the admiral goes, I don't know what to do. I have found out there's a group that threatened him, threatened to demote him, but also kill him, that has more power, more money, and their technologies and aircraft, which are these man-made UFOs, can do circles around the best thing I know, which is to be too stealth. He said, so it's basically game over. I said, no, you cannot say game over. But this is a literally an illegal, unconstitutional, largest corrupt enterprise in the world keeping all this I've shown you tonight secret. It is a criminal enterprise. It is not sanctioned by the president. It is not sanctioned by Congress. And yet they're using our tax dollars and are raping the planet and destroying the earth and impoverishing half the planet. That's what we have to fix. Next. This is just the value of the raw materials. Look at these numbers. $150 trillion dollars in oil, that's actually an underestimate now. 40 trillion in uh, coal, a trillion in uranium. But that's just the raw, when you multiply your effect, when you take it from there to retail and creating the energy, it's, it's many more hundreds of trillions. And that's what's being protected along with the Bretton Woods petrodollar, where they decide to make the dollar the reserve currency of the world, but it's based called the petrodollar. So the entire macroeconomic, global economic system is sitting on a crumbling foundation of the energy system we use. And it's going to have to be transitioned. It should have happened 100 years ago. Now we're out of time. Next. Here we mention media. This is a CIA document. It was released. I was surprised it was released. And it says that we have a relationship with every major wire service, newspaper, news weekly, and television network in the nation. Next. In many instances, we have persuaded reporters to postpone, change, hold, or scrap stories that could have adversely affected national security interests or jeopardized sources and methods. Here's another part of your Truman Show you, everyone's been forced to live in. The idea that we have a free press or that we have a free market economy. Pray tell, any economist in here, I challenge you, how do we have a free market if the most important scientific breakthroughs of the last 100 years have been ruthlessly confiscated, people murdered, and kept off the market? No, it's a controlled economy. 
It's a controlled media. It's an abomination and it's killing the planet. Next. And so what do we do? Well, the current paradigm we just went through, the new would be unlimited abundance, no poverty in 20 years. There would be no poverty on earth in 20 years with these technologies. Universal peace because you're not fighting over everything now. And earth in harmony with humanity and the biosphere restored. What do I mean by that? Next. This is why I say we have to have a global Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan in World War II was when we funded enormous undertaking to rebuild from the ashes Europe after, after the World War II. We need a global, we'll call it not a Marshall, but it'd be the equivalent, where the whole world comes together and says, we're going to bring these technologies out. We open source it. It gets proven by all, every university. And it begins to replace all the existing systems, including wind, solar, plug-in electric cars. They'd all be replaced. Now, we're talking an enormous undertaking. Why? Next slide. There are 2.3 billion houses on the planet. You have to get energy to them, but you could have something that would fit on this table or smaller that'd run your house. It would have no wires going into it. It would never run out. It's not based on the sun or the wind. It would give you, it would be free once you had it in there, and they're not expensive. It'd be the price of a heat pump, a few thousand dollars. And there'd be no pollution. But how do you get 2.3 billion of them made? Same thing. We have one and a half billion cars and trucks on the road. How do you retrofit that? Now, the Jenkins device you just saw would retrofit them to a water, 91, uh, 95 to 99% water, and that could happen very quickly. But to actually replace all the current car engines, we only make 100 million cars a year. If we convert it like that, which is not going to happen, all manufacturing of automobiles to these zero-point energy generators, it would take, do the math, 15 years. We barely have 15 years left. The date I've been given, 2035 to 2040, and we're done. We have 26,000 airplanes, big jets, all these cargo ships. Next. And then we have millions and millions of miles of paved road. We don't need them. Next. I love this. Do you know the date of the Eisenhower interstate system? You go out here on the 10 or 405 or wherever you are. 1955, the year I was born. Ironically, that was one year after we didn't need surface roads. <laughs> Think about it. We, in the, you know, of course, the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. So we built, you know, all the land that is underneath these concrete and mess and filthy, that was needed beginning in 1954. Next. And I have said this for years, a smart power grid is no grid. Look at these wires where I'm staying down here. We go on the roof and look down, and it's like this tangle of wires like in 18... 95 in New York or the early 20th century. You know, we don't need this. We're going to spend a trillion dollars, they estimate, upgrading this, the grid that we currently have because it's so creaky. No, with that kind of money you could have in every home in America, one of these free energy devices, you get rid of the grid. Get rid of it. Next. But we have to do it compassionately. Now, this is a key point. You cannot displace millions of people who work in utilities, linemen, the oil and gas industry, ruthlessly. But if we spent $10 trillion, we printed up $10 trillion for COVID, the world can provide a multiple of that to transition. But you got 15 years. It doesn't have to happen in two years like COVID funding. It can happen over this period of time. We can do it. But the big stakeholders in the current global economy and energy system are going to have to be stood up to by who? We the people. Next. So, yeah, so that's what it's going to take. So I always love this, this idea, which an ET said to, next slide, uh, Philip Corso. You know this story. You've heard me say it. But if you haven't, I'll just briefly tell you. Colonel Corso, who was an a Air Force colonel, in 1950s, he was out at the White Sands, and an ET crap broad daylight came in and landed. He rushed out there. And 
they had been targeting ET vehicles that had been examining extraterrestrial vehicles where we had our nuclear facilities and detonated weapons. And Colonel Corso in, has, has told us that basically when he asked the ET, you know, to, well, why are you here? He says, well, you need to change how you're living. You have to get rid of these horrible weapons because the nuclear uh, atomic weapons, when they're detonated, it sends out something beyond the electromagnetic pulse that tears the fabric of the universe for communication and travel from other planetary systems. That's a secret the physicists mostly don't know about, but that is very true. So, and, and, but Corso just said, well, what's in it for me? You know, a very brash, young, you know, a military colonel. And the ET says, a new world, if you can take it. Next. And so I love this. I found this picture. You've all heard of the Hopi prophecy, probably. There are two lines on the Hopi prophecy. Right now, our entire planet is on the line, the upper line that terminates. We're an extinction-level event trajectory. That's the path we're on. There's another line in the Hopi prophecies, and that's one that we have to jump onto that goes on and on forever. That's our choice. We, the people, have to choose it. It is not going to be done for you like a Ouija board in Washington or in Wall Street. We're going to have to unite and do this ourselves. Next. And this is why it's a new world, because it's a power to the people. What do I mean by this? The power we currently have is highly centralized globally in a relatively few numbers of corporations and interests. When this happens, everyone will have the ability to have their own power at home, for their car, manufacturing, Agriculture. You'll see this in a moment. And what it means, it's literally not just electric power and energy, but actual political power. And the power of the people will go back to the people. And in the industrial era, from the 1800s to now, it's gotten more and more concentrated. This is going to return the power to every village and every person. Even the deserts shall bloom, as it says in the Bible. And in... Africa and around the world, Bono with his you know, red program for Africa, they need to understand the way we're going to fix that is that they're going to leapfrog past where we are with all this electricity and wiring and power lines and power plants like they did telephones. They went straight to cell. But this is a bigger leap where all over the world, all these impoverished areas and where we're chopping down uh, the rainforest and people are dying of starvation, 9 billion people a year, Every little village and community will have its own energy generator for clean water, pulling water out of the humidity of the air. We have the technology to do that now. Why isn't it used? Because it uses a lot of electricity, which is polluting and expensive. So there's so many ramifications. And so what will happen in the next 20 years and in 50 years and 100 years, it will be a global village, all interconnected, but also all self-sufficient. Complete local self-sufficiency with no pollution. That's the world we could have had beginning in the 20s. 100 years later, may I suggest we accept it. It's time. Next. And why I call this a time snap? <clears throat> a time snap is when things have gone so far off track that the only way to fix it is for the people to unite, come up with a totally different strategy, and release it that energy, where in a decade to two decades, we make up for 100 years. It can happen. We absolutely, I believe, I would not be doing this if I didn't know and believe that could happen. It's got to happen. And, you know, if nothing else, humans do want to survive. But this is now a survival question for every man, woman, and child on the earth. So that's why we have to do this. Next. Look what happened during COVID when we weren't doing anything and, you know, polluting. The Venice canals, which are usually nasty, pristine. Next. The satellite showed the 30% drop in air pollution over the northeastern United States. Next. And then we get into what it really looks like. So here's where you get, this is just a graphic a volunteer on our team made. But a visualize for a minute. We're going to show a little video. It's fun. These are a warning. This, these are motion graphics in work. It'll be finished by 
before April when we released this uh, documentary film. But we really want to visualize, and let me describe for a minute before I play it. Visualize your house off the grid, clean energy, no wiring. Why? Because every device, whether it's this size device or your refrigerator, will have a small solid state quantum vacuum zero point energy device in it running it. So there's no electromagnetic fields running through your house because you don't need wiring. Think what that'll do to construction costs and the simplicity of it. Think about water. You live where there's not a lot of water. The air has water in it. You can pull it out. If you need to desalinate it, what happens? You can pull the desalinization, which costs a lot of energy, uses a lot of energy. But if you're pumping water and desalinating water from the oceans, which is the earth is two-thirds covered by oceans, right? All of a sudden, you have this flow of pure water anywhere it needs to go on the planet at very, very little cost. You have a lot of salt. So there are so many approaches to this. Next, let's play this. So I love this. This is a, a view, just sort of a graphic view we're working on. Great graphics team that's helping us with this project. And here we are in the Sahara Desert. And you want to grow food? You create a, a biosphere dome. It's run on free, clean energy, as you, we, we've demonstrated. You're growing oranges. You can grow crops. You can have different zones in it for different temperature and humidity control. So anywhere on the planet that you need to have foods, it could be done under controlled circumstances, digitally automated, but with no cost for the energy and the water, virtually none. What that means is the food scarcity and starvation we're facing, that goes away very quickly in a 20-year period. Um, so this is just one example of that. Next. And I love this. Here's your, your typical street in your neighborhood, anywhere in the world. And as we bring these technologies out, the grid comes down. We don't need it anymore. When there's a snowstorm or hurricane or whatever, you don't lose power because you're not dependent on a grid that's going to be torn down by ice and snow and wind. Then, as time goes forward, anything that you need in the house for energy, you have it can be in a closet in the base, not to be outside. It doesn't depend on the solar. All the wiring and the things you plug in, you don't need wires. And all these wires, it's a clutter of wires. You don't need them because every device will have its own source of energy. This could have been done decades ago, solid state. And here's your, you know, Los Angeles, where we are right now. And you see, you know, what it is. You live here. God bless you all. And but as we bring these out, all these freeways will, ha will, will be replaced. All the lines and power lines will go away. We can float above the surface. And in every city in the world, we're going to see this transformation. Every village in the world. And this can be done, this part of it, in about 20, 30, 40 years. Now, the things that fly, the, the electrogravitic, all those cool UFO thingies, that's going to depend on whether we become peaceful. What do I mean? Look at this. The nice thing about that is that you don't need a surface road. However, if you're a violent sociopath, that's a missile delivery system. So the first phase that should have happened in the 20s would be the energy. The second phase, when we have a peaceful world, a secure peace that is enforceable. And initially, it's going to be the peace of the chained rabid dogs, because there's always sociopaths who will try to take one of these UFO-type technologies and deliver a bomb into downtown LA. So that's going to have to wait until we actually have a just and peaceful planet. That may take a lot more than 20 years, maybe not. And then you have this, where medical healing. I was in a lab underground on the Mexican-Texas border near El Paso where they had technologies where it's classified, where a severed limb could be regrown. A severed spinal cord can be regrown. I saw it. It's highly classified. So medicine, being a doctor, I'll tell you, would be totally different. And then we have these cities, you know, eventually where 
you're just floating. There are, there are guided pathways. You know, the ground is pristine. And then we're going out into space. So everyone remember where our destiny is. Our destiny is not just Earth, it's the whole cosmos. And how is that going to be possible? The only way we're allowed to go outside our solar system is if we become a peaceful, universally peaceful civilization. Otherwise, it's locked down. You know, we are considered a planet that is dangerous and armed. And let's hold with this. This is so beautiful. I want to share this story because this is where I want to share the vision of where we're really going, the big, big picture. So about 100 years ago, we er entered a new era, a cycle, universal cycle, the duration of which is half a million years. The last one that just closed, they call them yugas in the Sanskrit, was about 450,000 years. We're the crossover generation. We're the last 100 years. So far, we've gotten it very wrong, but we can fix it. When I was a little boy growing up in a shack in North Carolina, poor, dirt poor, I would walk around as a three, four, five-year-old, and I would hear the planes. This is like 1950s, early 60s. And I go, I knew in my heart of heart, this shouldn't be here. I see belching diesel. I said, why is this here? I actually knew in my intuitive self that something was wrong. We had gone way off path. And this was the 50s. And I could just felt it. I remember crystal clear. I was meditating tonight before I came. I went, my God, that was like so palpable as I walked around. Everything I saw, I thought, Why, where are these power lines here? I, I just knew that this was, something was off the path. But if we get back on the correct path and do this unified action from the people, get off the internet and work to help us do this. Uh, you know, or if you're on the internet, spread the word of this. Why? Because we are really are running out of time. We do not have another century to burn. I do not think we have 20 years. So if we were to do this at an enormous pace, this is why the strategy is as follows. It has to be massively disclosed. Anyone who knows any celebrities who can drop a link when we bring one of this movie out or one of these technologies out, get hold of me. Because the media will be told, don't cover this. The establishment will say no way because the establishment is controlled by the stakeholders. But the people of the earth need to demand a new world, and we can take it. It's long overdue. Now, what happened here? At Rendlesham Forest in the Air Force Base in 1980, a pyramid, roughly pyramid-shaped craft landed. Not that big. You've all heard this count probably, but I'll recount it for you. And the part that's classified you don't know. And the Ministry of Defense, after I'd had some meetings over in England, released documents proving it landed. They had physical traces, all that. And we have this in our disclosure materials, if you, you know, read. Um, it's not politically correct to read. But anyway, if you do read, um, <laughs> then please do. And what you'll see is that this account has been proven. Now, what's fascinating to me is that one of the senior officers, there weren't many, there were American that got very close to this. There were these kind of luminous beings that literally teleported, floated outside this black, like an onyx black pyramid and communicated with these Air Force officers who did not want to be publicly associated with this story. They were afraid of being called a kook and ridiculed. And the ET said, we are your descendants who have become interstellar, but we are from 500,000 years in the future. And we are now here, they basically materialized, time traveled to 1980, because this was a covert nuclear weapons facility that if that had been disclosed could have triggered World War III. And saying, you've got to stop doing this. If you stay on this path, we, your children's 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 children, 20,000 years into the future, we won't exist. That was 42 years ago. So they have been warning these civilizations from other star systems, and some of them are, as we have gone through the universe, hundreds of thousands of years in the future, some of them are 
our descendants. Not all, not all, but some are. The key thing to remember here is, is that the fact that that happened is a message of great hope. It means that there is a chance, a good chance, if we reach into our higher consciousness and we go forward with a strategy that isn't based on materialism and greed, but we open source and release for free these technologies. We have every scientist in the world that wants to test it, reproduce it. We have it released without patents or intellectual property holdbacks. And we move it forward in an emergency plan for the planet. It's the mission to planet Earth. And if we do that, when there's enough abundance, but also we're not fighting over oil and this and that, there's a chance we can actually live together what Machu Kiko calls a, a level one civilization where we're not fighting anymore. And even if we have conflicts, we're not going to use arms. So once we become a stable, peaceful civilization, the universe will open its arms. We'll be allowed to go anywhere out there. But the, the, the ticket to get into the cosmic interstellar community is that we are peaceful, we are not destroying the planet, we have transitioned from sheer greed and materialism to a higher state of consciousness. But we know it's possible because our descendants came back and told us it was. So that's our future. So I hope all of us can join together. My hope and my prayer is that what we will do with this movie, if you can help us, is show the world that these technologies exist. Find support to create a new energy lab. What do I mean? 50 to 100 million dollars, it sounds like a lot, but in venture capital it's nothing, where you have a laboratory that's being live streamed continuously. Maybe not the people, but the workstations. The instant you get one of these devices working, the whole world has it. No intellectual property holdback, no patenting, and it's released in real time. And if it's not, you're all dead in that lab. I'm warning people. You cannot do it the way you would normally do an R&D program. So if we do it that way and we get out of this golem greed mindset in business and corporations, legal, all that, this is a special case. Go patent another cell phone. This we have to release openly because the only way we're going to catch up for our lost century and reclaim it is to do it very wisely. So information is easy to get. Knowledge, a bit more difficult. Wisdom, the rarest thing. The wisdom here is that the people have to unite around a strategy to do this that will actually work. And I don't think it will come from people who are conventional business and venture capital people unless they understand this message. Because they are miscalculating the national security implications, meaning big money, oil, and the petrodollar, let me translate national security again. And those corrupt interests that have hijacked even these covert programs in the United States, they are not going to go quietly into this change. They will do it because the people say, we're going to do it. I grew up in the civil rights era and marched. I mean, <laughs> dating myself and the gay rights era and the women's era. And rights era. And none of that happened. Gandhi did not liberate India because the King of England and the powers that be said, oh, yeah, no. But it was nonviolent. It was people power. And it was a mass movement. We have to do the same thing here because you cannot disclose these technologies to a thousand people. And when I say this film, unacknowledged, has had 760 million people see it, this needs to cross a billion. And we need your help to do it. Why? Because it's going to take that many people aware of this to join forces both financially, scientifically, strategically to get this done in the 20 years it must be done. So if in the next two years we have an initial version of this device, one of these devices, like you've seen all these examples I went through very quickly, then you've got to retrofit the whole planet. You don't do that like downloading an app. That is manufacturing, distribution. So to stand that up for 2.3 billion homes and 1.5 billion cars. But think of the billions of people that don't have a home and don't have a car. And the 3 billion people burning down the rainforests to make charcoal to cook their food. 
This is a massive undertaking, my friends. But I'm convinced we can do it, but we have to completely rethink how we live, how we act, and the whole business model of what we're doing. And if we do that, here's the world we're going to have. We will be remembered as the generation that pulled ourselves off the extinction line of the Hopi prophecy and moved on to the one that goes on forever. Thank you all. We, we can do it. Thank you. I love you all. You're beautiful. Good night, everyone. I'll see some of you later at the party. God bless you. And please help all that you can. Good night.